think definitely they do need more power. Just got to be able to stop those people that are doing that thing. You have to do what you have to do to save the country, or to at least protect the country. How some Canadians feel today about police powers in the wake of a week of violence. It's unclear how much the Parliament Hill shooter was motivated by ideology, but authorities are monitoring dozens who certainly are. And tonight, on a special edition of the Sunday panel, we're looking into how far we're willing to go to respond to that threat. On Thursday, it was an uncommon show and tell. The video that you'll see is the scene at the entrance to the parliamentary precinct. The head of the RCMP displaying the assault on Parliament Hill in stunning detail. This is the suspect carrying a weapon running up towards the East Block. Another view of the same transaction. For counterterrorism officials, Michael Zahaf Bibo wasn't on the radar, but the other killer was. He's known to police, yeah. One of roughly 90 radicalized individuals monitored by authorities who could not act until it was too late. We could not arrest someone for thinking, uh, for having radical thoughts. The government is now looking at expanding police powers. Those elements of the criminal code that allow for uh, preemptive action. In 1970, the government went much further to deal with radical Quebec separatists. The senior British Trade Commissioner in Montreal, James Richard Cross, is reported to have been kidnapped by as many as four armed men believed to be FLQ terrorists. Ottawa responded with soldiers in the streets. The yeah, well, there's a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is uh, go on and bleed. How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. Pierre Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act. Hundreds of Quebecers were jailed without charge. The War Measures Act suspends the operation of the Canadian Bill of Rights. And the FLQ murder of a Quebec minister dampened public doubts. But what was supposed to be an insurrection turned out to be just a small band of criminals caught through normal police work. The War Measures Act was a very blunt instrument. It was an, an excessive measure. It wasn't as serious as we thought. We have to leave now. These days, anxiety is high, threats are being tracked, and there's pressure to act before another attack. I'm joined by our panelists now. Brian Stewart is a senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and a former senior correspondent at CBC. Veronica Kitchen is a professor at the University of Waterloo, focusing on counterterrorism and security. And Barry Cooper is a political scientist at the University of Calgary. So a lot of coverage this week, and uh, many Canadians were seeing these people, particularly Bebo, more sort of as a lost soul than a, than a lone wolf terrorist. But other Canadians, are, as we saw, are, are quite scared. The police, the government is saying it's time for more power. Should there be something as heavy as a return to like a mini war measures act, Brian? Oh, good heavens, no. I mean, I think uh, that was one of the great shames of Canada, the modern times. Uh, those hundreds arrested came to nearly 500. Uh, all in empty intelligence, overblown government fears. Uh, very, very few were ever charged, and, and most of the ones, all the ones I knew, were completely innocent and were traumatized by the experience. This country does have a tendency, as we saw in the First and Second World War, of the mass internments of aliens, that, to go a little bit overboard, not more than a little bit, quite a bit overboard, in fact. And we have to guard against that. This is a, uh, we tend at times to exaggerate the threat we, uh, we, we get very worked up. And in this case, uh, in particular, I think we have to be very careful. We take time to think about what we've already got in place before we put anything else in. Veronica, is it time for something big? No, I agree with Brian. This is, this is, not, this is a national tragedy. It's not a national emergency. There's, there's really no reason to think that we need something as extreme as uh, using the Emergencies Act or something like a new War Measures Act. Barry, you with them, or what do you think? <laughs> All in? It's a consensus, yeah. yeah. And particularly when, uh, as it was uh, mentioned, it was ordinary police work that uh, mm -hmm. finally found those guys, not, uh, not having all the troops in the streets of Montreal. So back then, there was a fair amount of support for the War Measures Act in the, in the early, during the October crisis. Yeah, but back then it was CSIS. Uh, CSIS didn't exist. The RCMP was in charge of espionage and, and terrorism. Um, and it was later revealed that with all that power, there was some abuse. Let's uh, just a quick flashback here. 
On a night in October 1972, a van, not unlike the one that is there now, drove up to that corner house. About a dozen RCMP, Quebec, and Montreal police members got out, broke into the house, and stole nearly a half ton of documents. <laughs> That's, That's my old trench coat. Yeah, <laughs> you, you look a little, little younger. Yeah. Well, uh, what that, were the implications of that? Because there were a lot of what were called then RCMP dirty. That tricks. was a very scary time. The government had given the RCMP basically carte blanche to go out and disrupt separatists and the FLQ in particular, and the RCMP security service. Uh, basically went overboard. They got involved in all sorts of burning down barns uh, to prevent a meeting, breaking in to steal documents, uh, even writing up fake FLQ communiques to throw confusion in the ranks of the FLQ. It was really was a force completely out of control, and of course they had a major inquiry, the McDonald Commission inquiry, which led to secret intelligence been taken away from the RCMP. So if no soldiers, I think you're all agreeing on that in the streets now. Barry, what, what do you think would be appropriate now? The government's calling for, for to change the, the criminal code. Well, I think that's the way uh, that the government would have to go. <clears throat> um, you have to change the criminal code in some respects. I think there should be obviously a full debate in Parliament uh, because the danger of giving any uh, law enforcement agency, as you said, a free reign uh, is simply to invite trouble. Uh, armed bureaucrats can never uh, can never be reined in uh, unless they're they're given a mandate uh, as to what their limits of action are. What kind of change do you think we're uh, we're going to see? I think before we make any legislative change, I want to make sure that we know what problem we're trying to solve. So I want to make sure that we know that resources that. Uh, the police and intelligence services already have are being properly deployed, that they're using and are able to use the legislative tools that they already have, and that there wasn't something that went wrong with existing tools before we, before we passed new legislation. And I agree with Barry that any new legislation should go through full debate and Parliament should not be fast-tracked. Well, the government has said that it wants to bring in amendments to the criminal code to allow, uh, to make it easier, actually, to, to detain people that it's suspicious of. This is what the Justice Minister, uh, Peter McKay, said this week. To see if there is a way, in fact, to improve or build on uh, those elements of the criminal code that allow for uh, preemptive action, um, specifically in the area of terrorism, but not to, not to rule out uh, areas in which we think uh, we can prevent crime. What is he saying there, Brian? I was astonished to hear that. In fact, is he implying that any new detention measures brought in could be expanded to the civilian area, to the criminal? Could we start detaining criminals now because we perhaps think they might be about to commit a crime? It's a very alarming statement, which I hope he can explain detain in coming days. Civilians, it detains civilians. Well, detains, well, detain anyone who's suspected. Um, I, I think... We, I think they're going to have to be not only the normal care given to this new legislation, but we have to remember that the MPs themselves, the ones who are drawing up the legislations, are the near victims who were physically traumatized. They were right, you know, when they had the bullets flying around them. So I think we have lawmakers now perhaps even more worked up, and I can certainly sympathize with the trauma they felt and the fears they felt. I think they really need to take a deep breath now and go into ask, answering these questions that have been raised. What's wrong with the laws we've already got? Why aren't they working? Are we sure they're not working? Well, Barry, Right now, you cannot uh, charge anyone for thinking radical thoughts, but is there a step in between? There's um, a big difference between uh, preventing terrorist action and uh, dealing with criminals. Um, the, the police are very good at surveilling. Uh, they're pretty good at detecting who their targets would be. They're not very good at stopping them from acting. Do they need and more powers, though? They, there, I think they do need uh, to be able to do something. But that's not the same as, as uh, dealing with criminals. Uh, there's a, a real difference between security intelligence and police work. So is this a big door being opened? It's a very big door. Huh. And back to the, the 90 or so where they're, they're particularly concerned, the potential lone wolfers, those who come back perhaps from Iraq. And I mean, watch what the British have been doing. A lot of senior British security officers are, officers are saying the key here is not to send people to jail necessarily. The key is to get these people programmed and turned around mm -hmm. and perhaps becoming vital sources 
in the fight against terrorism. And they're making one point we have to remember. A lot of those coming out of Iraq and Syria are in effect fleeing. They were traumatized by what they experienced, what they felt back there. And just days ago, ISIS sent out a warning that it was prepared to kill those who departed. So some of those 90 will be back in Canada are not back to plan future, I think, terrorist attacks, but may indeed be running for their lives. Veronica, so what do you think of this approached. suggestion that, of, that it should be made easier, the thresholds should be lower to make it easier to detain people before they've done something or before there's evidence that they're planning something? I think it's always a red flag if you're trying to lower thresholds for detention in a democracy. But that's and, what they're talking about. Yeah, no, it, uh, absolutely. And so I think that, um, again, there are, there are already legislative tools we can use. The com Combating Terrorism uh, Act already does allow for preventive detention of 24 hours. But it didn't work, you could hours. argue, that Couture Rouleau was, was on their radar. Yeah, and there may be just be situations where it, it doesn't work and can't work. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know why they had sufficient evidence to take away his passport, but not to Bebo's arrest him, passport, Bebo's yeah. passport, and not to arrest him under existing legislation. Uh, but if someone truly is only thinking radical thoughts and you truly don't have evidence, then even, even something like the, the preventive detention measures aren't going to work. We have to be careful in thinking that somehow our security forces are, are messing up all the time and up to the chat. Up till this, the, the last week, They've been extraordinarily successful yes. in Canada. They've broken up every single plot one after the other with very well-highlighted arrests. But so, now you have the RCMP, you have the local police, you have the Minister of Justice all saying, we need more power. But also, good. Look at what's happening in the U.S. and the good, U.K. Good you mentioned these, this number of forces because we mustn't think of ourselves as just low on the ground when it comes to officers. We have CSIS, we have RCMP, city police, provincial police. There's a huge community out there, infrastructure of counterterrorism that we can use and use well. So we're not necessarily in as bad a position as we may think. Barry, think. after 9-11, and no one is comparing what happened in the last week to 9-11, obviously, but there, there was a big change in mood in the States and there was serious clampdowns on civil liberties. Do you think after what happened this week that the mood will change from, you know, people doing yoga on the hill to, to something a bit stricter? It probably will, and in some respects, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you can make the parliamentary precinct a lot more secure with minimal uh, physical barriers, uh, and, and that would not have any impingement on our civil liberties at all. So, I mean, there are certain things that we can do without, without really uh, having to change a great deal of, the, of, our, of our laws. And, Veronica, the other thing that happened this week that sort of passed under the radar was the cyberbullying bill mm -hmm. that will now... It's past third reading... Uh, will now allow uh, the police to uh, investigate people's online activity. If it could be used for cyberbullies, could it not be used for suspected jihadis too? Is that... Absolutely. It's, it's a change to the lawful access regime, and uh, we've called it the Cyberbullying Act, but it, it is a change in, to the way um, the RCMP and CSIS can access information from third-party providers. Mm. So where are we then? What do you think, Brian? Are, are Canadians more open to change? Is that the government wants I think uh, to crack some, down? I, I think they're somewhat open to change. I don't think they're terribly, terribly traumatized by this. I think the shock will, will they'll move on. It was a tragedy and a horror. But it's not 9-11, as you pointed out. It's, it, we have to keep it in perspective. I think, too, though, they will be looking for other ways to get through to this number. And I think I'd like to see what the government's planning to do for interventions. Is it possible to go up to some of these people and just say, hey, we've arranged a meeting with your parents, your older brother and your best friends. Come on and join us. I think there may be ways in which you can actually approach them other than just saying, how can we get them arrested and before a judge? Last quick point, Barry, and then Veronica, on what you're watching for. I think we are at a, at a point where we have to uh, deal with what, what uh, people in the business call nuisance terrorism. How much are we willing to uh, tolerate uh, in order to maintain our, our society the way that we you enjoy it? You think some? Probably more today than a week ago. Mm. It'll go on, and I think we'll get used to it. I think as societies in Britain and the United States, to a certain extent, have got used to greater security, but the essence of the country continues, the essence of the democracy continues. Last quick point, Veronica. We have to live with terrorism, but I think that we've learned a lot since 9-11 about how to deal with terrorism, and I'm fairly confident that uh, if we do make legislative changes, um, I hope that we'll put in the appropriate oversight uh, 
and, and not change a lot about our society. Well, there was a lot of hugging and solidarity among the parties uh, in the House this week after such a sad and shocking week. We'll see whether it holds once the legislation <laughs> comes through and it gets more contentious. Thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you.